right. What is going on, everybody? It's your girl, Pam, with 2200 Taps. Hey, I don't. we have a show today, and I have no idea where the hell it's going to go, but I don't even really care because I am joined today by two guys, uh, one of which I was stationed with a while back, and he was actually on the show uh, probably when we had seasons, like second season or something. Uh, and then another dude that I met recently who's his roommate – uh, it's not a, it's not like that, but they are definitely very close. They are work husbands. Um, <laughs> and <clears throat> excuse me, the reason I brought them on today is we were kind of shooting the shit l- last week and, uh, they're, they're about nine hours ahead of us. So when we were talking, we were just, just going, I'm like, why are we not recording this? So that's why we're doing this. So, uh, we're going to kind of pick up where we left off and who know who the hell knows where this is going to go, but it's very much related to our topic. And before I keep rambling on, I want to formally introduce to you guys, Drew and TJ. What's up, dudes? What's going on? Yep. Living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> Waking up in nightmares. Right. Yeah. We're uh, dry February. I made it a whole 18 hours. Uh, hey, I made 70. You did. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even make it that long. Uh, so. it, it was good. It was Cheers good. to sobriety for yeah. 18 hours. Hmm. Cheers as they down their whiskey and I down my coffee. <clears throat> well, I have a coffee cup that says on the outside, might be whiskey. So, <laughs> oh my God. Well, hey, thank you guys for joining us. They are actually in a undisclosed location. We're not going to give away their their uh, location because it's called OPSEC and there's a lot more other stuff there that they won't even share with me and I really don't want to know because I don't want any FBI or anybody tapping on my door. So with that, they are currently active duty and that's why I said that. Uh, But they have definitely dealt firsthand what it's like on the inside with mental health and, uh, you know, Drew, go back to Drew's story. Like I said, season season two had him and his wife. Um, Drew lost his father-in-law to suicide, and after talking uh, to you, TJ, you know, and, and Drew last week, we were just literally kind of sharing our own experiences. So I, um, I'm i glad you guys joined in, uh, are joining us. Excuse me, it's like 8 o'clock my time. Feels like 8, but anyways. Um, I just, you know, the table's open, dude. The floor's open. We're just going to, like I said, shoot the shit and kind of see where it goes. How about that? Sick. All right, cool. So with that, we I mean, we were all talking about our own stories, our personal experiences. So let's kind of pick up with that. If any of you two knuckleheads remember what you're even saying. <laughs> that, that was so many sleeps ago. Oh, man. I know. But I know I, like we, we, we talked about crews and um, yeah. a lot of uh, – a lot about uh, – the individual that really pushed that, like granted, Cruz did what he did, but uh, he was definitely pushed to the extreme. By I ever see that motherfucker. And for yep. those that the, for those that don't know, Cruz, pick them up to speed. The short, short version of who he was to you. Uh, uh, short story, long or long story short. Uh, Jonathan Cruz was a uh, gunner's mate uh, in, in the Coast Guard. And uh, him and I, we, we were friends in North Carolina uh, for about, th- he was there for about two years. And uh, we, we can even be, be uh, distant friends. Um, good guy. Uh, always, always wore his, uh, his emotions on, on, on his, uh, on his cuff, as it were. Um, just always wanted to do. The best he possibly could. He was he was definitely a performer type individual, um, and he moved down to Key West and got stuck on an FRC. And uh, I think it was like right out right around like their six month inspection, yeah. their, their 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 forming inspection or stand up inspection, whatever that's called. Yeah, because this is when they were just starting to pull in, yeah, and get that uh, program started. Yeah, he was so he platform. was just put under a, a bunch of synthetic stress that he just didn't know how to cope with and thought there was a better plan to no longer burden anyone and checked a pistol out of the armory, went out to his forerunner and, you know, Jackson Pollock, the interior of his car. So, so he did it. He actually did it with uh, an issued firearm. Yeah. With yeah. The, yeah. With a, with a SIG. Yeah. Holy crap, um, dude. Yeah, it 
uh, that thing got boxed up, shipped out to Crane, Indiana, and it, as far as I know, is either still in possession or is uh, waiting for destruction. So. so let me ask you this, TJ. You're, did you know Cruz personally? So I had kind of like a weird six degree of separation from him where I went to A school with his brother. Um, oh, okay. Went to A school with his brother. I went, I worked for the warrant officer who was the first gunner to find out what had happened through a phone call from the uh, commanding officer on that boat within like minutes of occurring. Uh, and then one of the guys that, that a good buddy of mine was in Seattle with Cruz relayed the story of, of how, or with, with Nate, I should say, relayed the story to, you know, they called Nate in and to the chief's mess. And Nate said, he already knew it was like, my brother killed himself, didn't he? So, he, you know, so he was kind of separated from it, but it was knowing his brother and his personality. Um, I assume that, that, you know, Nate and John were pretty similar where they were both go-getters. Uh, Nate's still in. I've uh, I almost met him uh, when I was stationed at the Academy. He was going through OCS. So he went to the dark side, but, um, <laughs> wow. you know, he followed a, a number of ours that I know. Uh, his footsteps so it was kind of it was hard on me even though i didn't know john directly i knew how it affected his brother you know indirectly i hadn't talked in eight years but you know that's got to be hard to lose lose a brother like that so that was it was that was a tough month um there was a, a string for the gunner's mate world where we lost a lot of significant people either to accidents or suicides there was like what four or five in that one month we had, well, we had uh, one the, the that we, yes. Yeah, so the motorcycle wreck was somebody who I knew directly. In there, fact, I still have his there two office. suicides. Well, there was cruiser. And then shortly after or shortly before there was the gunner. Yeah. Gunner. Yeah. And then, yeah. It's crazy. So let me ask you all this because both of y'all, <clears throat> excuse me, both of y'all are in a, what we would consider a supervisor role. And you guys have subordinates, you guys have people you've got in, but here's the flip side, right? You guys were in a role back then where you, you had an opportunity to talk to whether it was SISM or somebody or what have you, right? Depending how directly you were involved with, with Cruz's death, right? Did you feel safe or did you even consider seeking some kind of help? when this this shit was going, whether it was with him or somebody else that you may have known or you know what I'm saying? Like, did you feel like safe enough to do that? Did you feel safe to go to your supervisors? And if so, or if not, now that you're supervisors, how are you showing up for your subordinates? Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah, no, not, not get you. Um, I, I've always had the ability to talk to someone. Um, but the, I, I came into the Coast Guard, like right at the tail end of the old guard, mm. you know, spent, um, the, the whole go, you have to go out, but you don't have to come back. Um, yeah. kind of my, um, and also where I grew up, like you just, like men didn't really flex out their their feelings all that well um you know and not not to say that they couldn't but it's just like you just didn't um so like every time you know schism would come around like like when when wiley when wiley passed yeah um you know we we had all the support there if we wanted to talk mm -hmm. uh, uh, if anything, I want to talk to a bottle of whiskey and go handle it my own damn way. Um, there was no, there's no like, oh, do you want to talk it out? It'll just feel better if you get off your chest. Like, uh, no, mm -hmm. because if I talk, just keep revisiting it. Kind of like pick ab, like if you keep picking at it, it's never going to heal. Um, but like the older I get too though on the other side of that coin the older i get the more i'm like you know it is kind of cathartic to get shit out i just i think i it, commands always want to try and do 
and cover their ass and like, hey, we're making this available to you. But they do it like right after the incident. Like, I, I don't want to fucking talk right then. Mm-hmm. I want to talk like six months to a year, year and a half, two years after the fact. That way I can process everything and, you know, maybe get my feces consolidated. So I, the, the Coast Guard does have like probably the right programs in place. But they just kind of ram them down your fucking throat. They do, or they, it's lip service, and that's it. Oh, yeah. You know, and that's pretty much where, where it ends. Over their ass. Right. You know, it's just that right. way, it's a check in the box. It's yeah. to make something green on, did, on a did spreadsheet. You, did you call the chaps and have him come down to talk right. to the crew? Like, so that's, did. I'm glad. Oh, the way you put that, TJ, that's like probably one of the best ways I've heard somebody sum it up. It's lip service, and that's about it. To that's cover that's their much, ass. Now, where my perspective of the employee assistance program comes from personal experiences, I've been in it pretty much on, on the regular. Uh, every couple of years, something usually comes up uh, since 2010, whether that's divorce one or divorce two, whatever number that you're up to. Uh, you know, whatever notches you have in your belt, some of us more. No. Um. Or uh, where, unfortunately or fortunately, because everybody that I know has survived, where I've intervened in three different suicides throughout my career already. My first year of being a first class, I had to um, participate in retrieving a firearm from my direct subordinate. You know, so that's it's definitely something that I'm very intimately familiar with, having that one was a little more difficult because I knew him very well. We hung out together. Um, he helped me. My, that was going on time. And, uh, and that was kind of a, we got through it and I made sure to point him in the right directions that, you know, where I didn't, I had a little bit of guidance Mm -hmm. able to give him a lot more guidance than even I had, you know, when I was a GM three, GM two going through, going through crisis. So, um, I know two of the two out of three of the people that that I intervened with, they are still serving and are still in um, a very productive life and will probably continue to. So it's not I'm not going to say that they'll never attempt again. Something else kind of push them over the edge. But at least I know for the time being, um, they were perfectly fine. And the first person that I intervened with, they were. they got out of the military and as far as I know, are still living a very productive life. So um, suicide is easy, easy for me to, to joke about. You know, my favorite joke is, you know, do you want to go paint these ceilings like Michelangelo or Kurt Cobain? Uh, that's my go-to one. Uh, but, you know, I, it has been something that I've dealt with. And uh, I do take it serious when someone says, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. Where if the signs are there, something will perk up. I'm like, oh, this is, this isn't a joke. This is serious. They, mm-hmm. they need some help. So. so it sounds like between you two and actually all three of us, it's more than just lip service. We've all, I mean, Drew, I think about your story. TJ, I think about what you've shared with us already. And I'm just like, fuck, dude. Like, this is what, this is what, this is how we can give back through our own traumas, right? And our own pains. It's like, dude, I've been there. I get it. I know you're hurting. It doesn't have to end up that way. Right. But it doesn't mean, and this is what we were talking about last week. Ah, light bulb. It doesn't mean it ever goes away for us. And we have our own things. And you guys, you can take us as far as you want on how you want to share this because, hey, this is a worldwide podcast. Who's going to hear it? Right. But if you feel safe enough to share whatever, we're here, you know? And I know for me personally, if I hit those dark spots again, it's just like, dude, I'd rather not be here. You know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Like, it never freaking goes away, ever. Yeah, yeah. It, especially like being over here, nine hours away. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, my, my my wife and kids are literally like my grounding point. They're, they're, they're the ones that I like keep coming back to. I don't want to upset. You know, I do have like my dark modes of like, man, 
let's just hit that permanent checkout button, you know? And yeah, I always think about like, well, shit, you know, I want to do to my daughter what my father-in-law did to my wife. Do, do I want to, do I want to do something extreme to my wife who already lost her father to suicide, who'd been exposed and been around suicide, you know, do I want to do that to her? I mean, how, how, how bad is that going to jack her up? And something that I, 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 I told my wife uh, a few years ago was um, I live my life for ghosts. What I mean by that is like looking back at my, at my grandfather my, and my grand grandmother and all these people that had passed away in my life that really meant a lot to me. You know, just thinking about like, would they be proud of me? Like, am I doing the right thing? Like, you know, just trying to like live for ghosts. And finally, I got to a point of wanting to live for myself. And now I want to live for my kids. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to screw my kids up because I'm dealing with a temporary situation and take a permanent solution to it. Um, and oddly enough, and it's, it's a complete rip off line of lethal weapon, but like, you know, why I don't do it, man. The job, the fucking job. I'm like, yeah, I'm getting too old for this shit. I am getting, (laughs) I thought that was going to be it. (laughs) Yeah. No, like, uh, Mel Gibson tells uh, Danny Glover, like, the reason why I don't put bullets in my head is because of the job. The fucking job, man. Like, that's kind of like I, I I, I do it for the job. I mean, I also do it for my kids and my wife. But, like, what would I, by me just peeling my muffin cap back, what would that do to, like, some, like, GM3, GM2, like, oh, fuck. Like, you just couldn't handle the stress. Right. Am I going to be able to do it? Or, or, or maybe they'll have like a complete and total opposite reaction, like, <laughs> pussy. <laughs> Which is yeah, happening. Yeah. I hated that guy, anyways. Like, I, I don't know. But it, it's, uh, it's funny you say that, though, real quick, because t- t- a couple of days ago was the, the two year anniversary of a death. One of my mentors who survived his first suicide attempt got back in the ring. He like fought his ass off for literally thousands of people. Helped me take it off the table. He ended up committing suicide two years ago. And let me tell you when, when your mentor or supervisor in this role, right? When somebody you look up to that helped you fight your own demons and heal from it, when they succumb to their own, let me let me tell you that is a mind fuck yeah. in of itself because it's like well if he couldn't make it am I going to be able to make it just like you said and it's it's so crazy dude it's so free like the human mind is freaking crazy but with that TJ you let me ask you do you have any kids by chance no not not Thank that I, Christ not that <laughs> I didn't reproduce right so, so let me well, add- uh, yeah okay. <laughs> I can do it. Oh, yeah. Do you want a decent run? Or? Well, yeah. Oh, oh they're, the they're, they're topping off their booze. Oh, yeah. That means these questions need to get a little bit more spicier. No. Yeah. Um, uh, while he's getting you your drink, Drew was talking about how he he's chose to fight for himself and live for himself, and now he's living for his kids and his wife. You, there's some listeners that are like, well, I'm not married. I don't have a spouse. I don't have kids. So what do I do? So, right. can I lean on you for that one? It would be easy for me to be like, fucking, I have had two completely failed marriages, you know. Um, I, I laugh. I'm like, you know, Drew has like three times as much time being married to one person as I did if you added up <laughs> combined all of my marriages. Um, oh. So then what do you look for? It's family. Uh, mom, dad, there's, there's brothers, everybody. Uh, up and down the chain, like you know, I'm the only active duty person in the family. 
right now. It probably will be until the next generation comes about. Um, so there's that kind of like pride kind of, kind of thing for the family. Um, there is the future because just because. Um, the fuck did you, you know, just put in your cup? Time out. What did you what? just put in your glass? You, Bourbon. Drew. Bourbon, and I got straight decent Serrano because of classy like that. Drew topped. Oh my god! You guys need to get on what? YouTube to see what the hell he just put in front of the camera. He topped. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> you know, people usually put like a swig so they can yeah. sip. Drew, you might as well uh, just brought the whole bottle. You dope. <laughs> well, I didn't want to get back up for another refill. I mean, I, I, I poured four fingers of booze. <laughs> Sorry. Hold up. <laughs> Your four fingers. Oh no, that's that's, that's a about four, four fing- fingers. That's three fingers for you. Yeah. Two. Holy shit. Yeah. Is that your bad hand? No, uh, no. Oh, that there it is. <laughs> Steady's a rock. <laughs> yeah, but this is one. <laughs> no, that's fucking shit. Oh my god. <laughs> Sorry, so I didn't mean to interrupt you, TJ. You were saying that's a. Okay. Um, so for really, it's like family and family it can be blood related. It can be um, if you're in a service or some sort of an activity, a club, an organization like that community, that can be your family. Yeah. yeah. There's been whether, whether, either, either, um, either, either, whether it's a, a community like a community, like some of the online stuff that I participate in um, that's military oriented, but it's still. You know, they're, it's, it's like soil and green. They're people too. Um, you just got to find a, a group, even as an introvert myself, I have to find a group of people that's like, okay, I can't let them down, you know? Um, and then if let's just say, let's go crazy and say, in the world, you're the only person alive on the planet. I would still find a way to live just because I had a raw spite for mother nature. and be like, fuck mm-hmm. you. I'm going to live as long. As <laughs> I think that, that is Thing keeps me going more than anything else is just spite of like, <laughs> no, I'm gonna see how far I can go. Like, my great grandmother made it to 103, I'm gonna make it to 104. Highly unlikely being the male in the family, dumb shit I do, but that's you know, that's kind of the goal. I think, I think we just found like the title of this uh, this video. What is it? Giving or the mill finger, <laughs> <laughs> giving what? <laughs> giving mother nature the mill finger, you know. Hang on, I'm gonna write that. <laughs> I like that. Giving Mother yeah, Nature right. the middle finger. Dude, I like that. I'm not. <laughs> I, I have no problem using pride as a, as a means of just surviving. <sighs> I mean, personal pride is, is such a great and also it can be, dangerous. It can get you in trouble. Dementing thing, yeah. It can get you in trouble. I, I'll admit that, you know, my failed marriage is part of it was a pride because I wanted to be like everybody else in the family, get married young, have kids, have the whole thing and have a military career and have um, a bunch of ambitions at the same time. And that's not possible. You know, um, it's cause you- what active duty, man, just being active duty alone and married is not for the faint of heart for either. Yeah, mo- side. Most of my, my grandparents, all my grandparents, my grandfathers, uh, couple of uncles, they've all did four and out. Um, I think at this point, if you added up all of their time served, um, I've served longer than all of them combined. So it's, and it's, but at this t- it's, it's a cost. There's been a cost and some of it has been that I put my work before anything else, mm-hmm. just because I loved it so much to the point where at this point, I enjoy what I do, but I'm burnt out on it. Not really, like burnt out to the point where it doesn't really stimulate me as much as it did five, ten years ago. I am looking forward. To it. Right, yeah. and it's not the work that I don't like. It's it's all the other stuff that comes along with the job that they don't tell you about in the recruiting videos. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, um, or you know, you go to the recruiting websites. Um, if if I only had to do my job that is specifically that it says on those recruiting websites, I would do this forever. But that's not all of it. <clears throat> well, they're not going to tell a, somebody they're trying to recruit for D.C., like, for example. Like, yeah, you get to do all this cool shit, but by the way, you're going to be cleaning shit. Like, yeah, straight up. Check. You're going to be <clears throat> in, in the shithole cleaning some crap. 
We all have our thing, right? Because y'all are GMs. I was an MK. And it's like, I remember being hung upside down because I was smaller at the time, but I was the only female engineer. So those hard to reach places, guess who's going to be hung upside down to go reach them? (laughs) And you're just like, what? Or changing probes out of the, the poopy tank or whatever. It's like, Jesus, this is nuts. So... I don't know. I think it kind of makes you a little more saltier in a lot of good ways, but not so good ways. Uh, it's the politics for me, man. Like, if we could just do our job and just do it, we're good. Throw in some politics, throw in people that don't know what the F they're doing as far as investigations or this or that or sweeping shit under the rug. Well, That's I mean, we just had. God dang, dude. That, uh, or just managing our day to day activities. Like, you know, mm. questions with people. Like, it, and I joke things. Up about the ordinance world, go man. If we only had like a rate that did this stuff on a day to day basis and knew what they're talking about, why are you telling me what to do? literally spent 14 years of my life doing this? But somehow, you with a four year degree came out of an institution no more than I do. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, I taught at that institution, I know what they teach you guys there. Are you talking about well, butter can- bars? <laughs> but, <laughs> but can you show me in writing? Yeah, where it says that, like I could. I could, yeah. but I don't have mm-hmm. hours to waste on your ego trip. Right. Yeah. Now, they're not all funny. Some of the kids that I interact with, they're going to be fantastic, but they are 1% of the individuals Great. that They're the with. smartest kids with Down syndrome. Yes. Oh, shut up. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I remember. I was telling, like, GM guys. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah. I feel like we're getting a glimpse of what it looks like in the GM locker, in the gun locker with you guys. Oh, yeah. They're not Minus the dragging. alcohol. No, no, uh, no, 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 no. We never do that. Although, we had somebody do that, not in Sabine, but I knew of a guy who posed in the gun locker with a gun and a bottle of Jack, and his ass got reamed and posted it on social media. Don't do that. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah, uh, last year, hard 800,000 swimmers, and you were the fastest. Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, I think the booze is kicking in, guys. It's, it's great. Oh, no, I'm like the sober, drunk, but it doesn't matter. Sure. You're definitely yeah. more sober than when, when we were the last time when we interviewed you. Hi, I can't even talk. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> You're definitely sober. more sober this time. Uh, beg, beg pardon? Uh, who, who's been drinking here? I don't know. My, I just got tongue tied by coffee. I don't know. Or maybe, uh, maybe, maybe it's coffee. That's all, folks. <laughs> oh, hell. So, what else is on the agenda? Thank you all for sharing all that shit, by the way. I'm not good stuff. Oh. <laughs> We're just barely ripping the band aid off. Let me tell you what I think about this. Up, <laughs> yeah. kids. Yeah. Here comes the bumpy ride. Oh, man. Stop. Uh oh, TG's got his phone out. Yeah, uh, this the schedule and stuff. I can't talk about it. It's super secret shit. Yeah, secret, secret, squirrel, secret squirrel. Oh wow, y'all are going fishing tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, actually, we're going to see you on Monday. Hopefully. Oh, you fucking bastard! Yeah. We're just keeping everybody in suspense as far as like where you guys are located. Yeah. That's so all. we it's just used to, suspense. Uh, <laughs> I used to. I don't know. If you know right? There's a giant kitty litter box involved. There is. Yeah, they're in an apartment. They're in an apartment. We, we are in an apartment. <laughs> yes, thanks. Thank you for the taxpayers. You paid for the whole <laughs> Yes. So cheers. <laughs> for your taxes. I, I, but, uh, yeah, bitches. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> um, I did have something and then I forgot. You had something and then you, you forgot. Really oh, I had, we used to, um, I don't know if we were recording when I mentioned it, but I did have a podcast with a fellow Coastie years ago. We didn't touch anything Coast Guard related. Um, but we uh, we would call it, when we were doing operations, we'd call it going downrange, kind of as a jab. Like special teams we have in the Coast Guard. Yeah, we're, we're downrange right we're now. We're downrange. Yeah, we're in Fort Angeles, Washington. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it was a, we tried to, we tried to around it but if you pay attention to it you figure out it's just two to three gms sitting around talking about video games and um music and stuff like that but eventually 
we were like, fuck it, we just came out, so to speak. So, <laughs> nope. Bagels. And then, bagels? Bagels? And then, uh, yeah, and then every other show that I've been on, I just come out and say it. And it's, it's great when you're surrounded by a bunch of army dudes talking about stuff. I'm like, I'm the Coast Guard. I'm like, the what are you doing the Coast Guard? To get, get caught in the puddles? Like, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what Which, that's what it starts off with. And then by the end of the show, like, yeah, I should have joined. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, then, then they start drinking. They go, all right, let's real talk. I should have went to your guys. <laughs> I, have, I have probably interacted with, let's say, 100 individuals. And 90% of them are always like, actually, all of them are just big chest beaters. Like, oh. Ninety percent of those hundred are like, you know what, man? I should join the Coast Guard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> or or they'll, they'll hit you up. But what was the deal? Was your IQ just too low? <laughs> uh, lot, like, find your DMs like, hey man, where's the recruiter? Like, Whoa, who's sliding in your DMs? <laughs> they, are they? God. Are they showing you like that? The purple the eggplant? Winky, they're like the winky, <laughs> winky emoji. Yeah. yeah. God. Yeah, dude. People I interact here on the civilian side, they're like, "Yeah, Marine, you know, Army vet, this, that, and the other." What about you? I'm like, I'm a coastie. And honestly, like, yeah, they give me shit, but there's quite a few Marines. Almost every Marine I've met, they're like, "Yo, I've I've gone underway with the Coast Guard. Like, you guys are some awesome shit. Y'all do some hard stuff. People don't realize what you do." I'm like, <laughs> "Yep." <laughs> we get more love from the Marines, I think, than any branch. That I've personally I, experienced. Oh, yeah. Well, dude, Although I, mean, I, I noticed younger Marines don't understand as much as older Marines. The older Marines are always like mad props, respect. The younger Marines usually give you a hard time until an older Marine comes over and cleans the shit up. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, that Fucking pussy, couldn't serve a real branch. Like, actually. Yeah, and then here comes Staff Sergeant. Uh, mm. The correct. <laughs> Gun fuck you up, so I'll see y'all later. <laughs> I had a, a Vietnam vet, Marine. We were, I don't know where I met him, but we were talking and he's like, I, I was like, you know what pisses me off is when it's like people don't hate us because we're not combat oriented, right? The air quotes, combat. He looked at me, he's like, you know what, kid? He's like, you might not be combating the enemy, but you're combating somebody else's enemy. I was like, for somebody that did a lot of SAR, I was like, eh. Yeah, who in their right mind wants to go out in 10 to 20 foot seas to go help somebody? Or hurricane force winds? Nah, who wants to do that crap? Well, you know, world renowned as being <laughs> mother of nature. She's a bitch. Mo- yeah. If you if you think you're going to beat mother nature, you're sorely mistaken. Hey, that falls into the giving mother nature the middle finger title that you threw at me. Hell yeah. I think you're on to something. Wow. Mark, <laughs> I actually was fortunate enough to share a beer with a uh, Coast Guard combat vet from Vietnam. No uh, shit. We were when I was at, out in Port Angeles, and they had the Vietnam, the mobile Vietnam Wall going mm-hmm. around. And we did the Color Guard event for them, and uh, all the other members of the Color Guard team were like, "Oh, we're going home," but I was like, "I'm going to take this opportunity." And uh, he was a became a, a YN eventually, but I think during the war he was a fireman or a seaman or something. And he was on one of the 82s that went over a sea water one. Oh, wow. Um, so he had stories of, you know, he was, I don't think he was there, but he was in theater for the Point Welcome event when the Air Force, you know, mis- mistook us and decided that we were a target. Uh, he was there for that. Kind of, you know, seeing that perspective from an actual combat vet. Um, I've been fortunate enough to handle some of the guns that we had captured from Vietnam, brought them back from Squadron One. Mm. So that that's usually a go-to. Uh, the team that I coached at the academy was the combat arms team, and I always brought up stories about Coast Guard going to war. And I always told the students, "I says we have been to war before; we will go to war again." Um, and just always remember that in the back of your mind that we need a small percentage of our force to do that that mission, um, whether it's shipboard. Or as much as we make fun of our LARPers, our professional LARPers, it's good to have that capability. Will, will we be the first team to get called up? No, but it would be nice to have that capability to go and do, uh, do well, direct action. And we're to. we're really good experts at, at what we do. Yeah. Uh, 
the the first time I was over, there, uh, we were we were going up to the Northern Arabian Gulf and guarding Abot and Kaot. There, these two oil terminals off the uh, coast of Iraq, and we're really good at running small boats and getting them up close and doing boardings. And we would we would sweep a tanker, like a big ass oil tanker, like Exxon Valdez size, stem to stern, top to bottom, in two hours. And we've looked at everything, and then we're off to the next one, mm-hmm. doing sweeps, doing sweeps. Um, we're so good at uh, our small boat operation that we we sent a team up to. Uh, damn. So the most southern port in Iraq. I'm gonna Google this because it's annoying me that you can't remember. <laughs> like, oh God, I should I should remember I was there. Um, but we or they the 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 Coast Guard ended up training the 101st on how to drive small boats, like little 25-foot Boston whalers. And like, hey, guys, don't fucking put a parachute on it. It won't fucking fly. All right? But we're, we're so good at our craft. It's, it's the reason why we deploy so far away, because we know how to do our job. We're, we're always constantly doing our job. You know, the Army is always training for their job. Marine Corps is always training for their job. Everyone's always like doing these, you know, hey, we're going out in the field for a week. Why? Oh, just for training. Was it Um Kassar? Um Kassar. God damn it. Yes. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. And which was the coldest beer south of Baton. Uh Yeah. So um, we're always doing our job. We're, we're, we're never just training. We're, we're, we're doing it. It's every day. It's, <clears throat> excuse me, well, if you're deployed or not, if you're stateside, like every day you're doing the mission. You're not waiting for wartime. Yeah. It's every freaking day. And um, were you with us, Drew? I don't know if we had this conversation. Were you with us? We we're doing a offshore boarding in Sabine and uh, we got sucked up under the deep draft in the 41. No, no, you, you told me about that. No. Yeah, that was, that was, uh, fun. That was fun. <laughs> Uh, who was at Helmers? No, Stu was what? Stu was a qualified coxswain, and then we had a break in coxswain, uh, making the approach to get the boarding team off. And it was a car. Mm. It was one of those car carrier ships. So it was very boxy. The whole. Oh yeah. And uh, next thing I remember, yeah. I was leaning up on the. They're, really- they're huge. Yeah, they're fucking. Huge. I went. Uh, I was leaning up on the starboard forty one, the the rail on the a- and aft. It was a starboard handrail, or whatever the hell it's called now. And I just yeah. remember looking up and looking up and looking up, and all of a sudden we're like almost under the belly of this thing. And I jumped in the pilot house, put my head in my hands. I'm like, we're done. Like we're turning into sushi, man. I heard glass shatter. The guys are yelling, and Stu ended up getting us out of there, but. We ended up uh, breaking the VHF antenna in half. That was the glass. We busted some welds oh. on the handrails. We pivoted off the damn, uh, what the fuck is it called? The pilot house? I'm forgetting all the jargon now. It's been a, it's been a while. But we pivoted because the rail went all the way up the pilot house, and we pivoted off of that to get out. And, pilot uh, ladder? The, the Acon ladder? Yeah. yeah. But either way, it just... I don't know how anybody we, we didn't lose anybody overboard or hurt somebody because that was that was that was that one sucked. <laughs> yeah, what's up with breaking coxswains trying to kill people? Because both times I I don't know one Dan was from a breaking coxswain. Hey, Still man. a good buddy. Hey, but good lord, man! If you don't release the seat painter and you pull away, that shit brings you right back to where you <laughs> were. Really back. Yeah. yeah, the boat came back. The boat came back. Yeah. Or or. But if you run over a lobster trap line and tangle up your engines in, in five footers, your engine cuts off and then all the water comes into your boat as it comes over the side and you're bailing it out with your helmet and shit and uh, just chaos ensues. Now, I've been wrapped up in so many goddamn close calls. I can't even count them. But after every single one, 
so fucking alive. Yeah. Like, woo! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, like all that drilling pumping through you, and then you crash. And you're like, yeah. Oh, I feel like shit. I, I can't tell mom about this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we I, had some good I ones. Tell, yeah. Man, I freak out. She'll be madder than a T Rex trying to turn off a fucking ceiling fan. <laughs> T Rex hates push ups. Push ups and hand grenades. Oh shit. Well, I mean, we could wrap up or keep shooting the shit. As far as the podcast is concerned, I don't really care. I think we got a good bit of uh, what it looks like on the inside. And here's the thing for my listeners: like, this isn't like, hey, this is a Coast Guard problem. This is a this is a military problem across the board. You know, it's a first responder problem. It is it is a human problem. This is all everyone of all walks of life and demographics, and. Um, man you're not alone and we keep saying that and we keep saying it's okay to not be okay but it's true and oh do you guys watch um <clears throat> excuse me i got a little gossip for you that's related to this i just found out and i don't really like to engage in gossip but this is kind of juicy so, what's his name <laughs> todd chrisley that's his name you know the, the yeah. chrisley knows best tv show yeah i didn't know it either until this year Anyhow, it's a family and the dad and the kids and the dad's like very anal, like it always has to be his way, but the family is always pushing back and there's an old lady, his mom, that gives him shit. <laughs> <laughs> what? I, I, I knew it. It's, it's, it's like, hey, this childish motherfucker's going, mm-hmm. Yeah. Was that you? Uh, is that you? <laughs> you'll find out in post-production. You'll figure it out. Yeah. Oh, shit. yeah. <laughs> well anyhow this is not the happy side of it i guess todd and his daughter savannah um responded to a call savannah's ex-fiance was about to take himself out like with a he had a handgun the whole nine yards in it and long story short the kid survived thankfully but tmz was like really quick to try to break the story all for money like they wanted to like create their own narrative for clicks yeah. and all this crap for money. And the Chrisley family came out with her ex fiance that almost attempted and was like, no, like this is some basically bullshit, you know, calling out TMZ and the media and all these people who would rather report about the kid trying to kill himself rather than, Hey, thank God he's alive and try to get money off this shit. I wanted to bring that up because this podcast and here, <laughs> we don't have any sponsors, believe it or not. And the more I think about it, I don't want sponsors. We don't want to make a penny off of people's stories. I think it's horseshit and bullshit. So we're, we're, we're going to be the sponsorless po- podcast. But with that, I just wanted to say, like, what are your thoughts around the media and or just anybody that's willing to take your story or somebody's like hurt and just try to twist it for their gain. What's your, what's your, what are your thoughts on that? I'm just, well, uh, yeah, I guess really depends on how important you are. I mean, everybody's important. Oh yeah. Everyone, but at, to what extent when, when Robin Williams died, that exploded, and it's still exploding. You know, there, there's still people there, yeah. you know, back to Robin Williams because he's a famous individual. He affected so many lives. Okay, but he's one of thousands of people that committed suicide that year. Yeah, I get it. Yes, he, he was a great individual, and he's raging the clerics. I love. I personally love the death. He did more for troops than than I can even think of. Well, my yeah, uh, Bob Hope. No, I mean, fuck, fuck Bob Hope. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say, uh, go, go, Lieutenant Dan, man, uh, Gary Sinise. Oh, Gary Sinise yeah. yeah, that guy too. Yeah, that, that dude rocks yeah. hard. If, I'm and he's a killer. Um, That's my goal to but, get him on the show, just so you know. Really? Mm-hmm. I'll tell you, I'm going to have to tell you in post because I can't quite tell the listeners yet what I'm working on. I, 
I would love I would love to just like tell that man like personally, Thank you, bro. Like you, you, you rock, bro. Uh, but no, like I think it really de- it it sounds jacked up, but it really depends on like how famous you are or how important you are. <laughs> really measures your life, and and when you commit suicide, kind of like oh. They checked out. They were such a strong individual, and they did it? Yeah. Happened to literally anyone, you asshole. <laughs> uh, I, so they're, they're celebrities, but they're not superhuman. Yeah. They're still people. They still have things that they don't talk about, that they don't want the public to know, especially a comedian. That's why a comedian is... Except the for they They're not really right, people. Well, okay. <laughs> But, but comedians in particular are very vulnerable to that because they're, I mean, I don't want to say if they're covering something up, they don't want people to feel the way that they feel. Well, yeah, I think comedians are probably more susceptible to the suicide because Com- comedians and uh, they the have- singers of grunge bands, because the only one that's still standing is any rest of them have died from drug overdose or suicide. Well, it, you're in a constant well, world of making Kurt people Cobain feel better. Shit. Oh, come on. Well, they were talking about comedians. If you think about it, when you go see a comedian, what are they doing? They're bashing the shit out of themselves. Well, but comedians are they they their gimmick or their their job is to make you laugh, mm-hmm. to give you enjoyment. But oh. at, at whose expense though? Yeah, well, it's not yours. When, when you're constantly <clears throat> living for someone else giving someone else enjoyment well what's left over for you bud <clears throat> you're just feeding it all out for everyone else i mean grand at a price but right. yeah. I mean, you're, you're giving out all your joy to someone else there's none left over for you i just feel like we are i feel like we've missed the mark as people as a society when we look up to celebrities and we are crushed or we are like automatically in depression because they die or whatever reason. And to some, I mean, granted, there are some celebrities that are heroes to people and I, I get that. But then right. that I- idolization where that it's just like, oh, my God. But, dude, it's like, what about your kids? What about your wife or your husband? What about the people in your own home? Would you feel the same way if something happened to them? And unfortunately, there's people that will be like, nope, because they idolize this person so freaking much. Like, their world is over when they die, depending on how they die. Like, Betty White or Bob Saget. I wonder how many freaking yeah. people have, like, considered taking themselves out because they've lost these idols. And I'm like, dude, oh. we're, we are so twisted. We are so just – and it's not them. Yeah. It's the fact that no one's given them a safe place to just uh, love themselves. For, I don't fucking know, dude. I'm, I'm on a freaking soapbox. I'm going to get off real quick. I don't know. Well, that's like <laughs> Chester Bennington. The left road – or what they believe, and she finally committed suicide because not a month or two earlier, Chris Cornell did, and they were very close. Um, I don't really, the only celebrity, I'll admit it, the only celebrity that I was like, holy shit, really kind of affected affected me, because again, I was single at the time and everything, was Chris Cornell killing himself, you know, because I respect him as a musician, you know, because of him, he influenced a lot of the music scene that I that I yeah. enjoyed. A lot of bands that I know, they were formed because of, of interactions with him. Whereas Bennington, I'm not a fan of playing the park, so I was like, eh, big deal. But it's, it's true. People can go, if that person can do it, then so can I. Mm. Mm. Which kind of goes back you to know? the whole, like, man, if they if they checked out, do I have a chance? Right. It's yeah. giving them permission to check out. It does. It kind of says, it's okay. You can do it too. <sighs> That's scary. And it also gives them a roadmap because then they can see – how the ripple effect of that person, then they know, okay, so this is what's going to happen to my family, my friends this is how they're going to feel. And then at that point, there's no more mystery in your mind. It's like, Oh, this is how it's going to play out. I have the playbook. <clears throat> uh, yeah. They'll get over it eventually. I, I just wonder, if a, I wonder if in a twisted way, like they see the family mourn and they, they really loved him. Like if they check themselves out, if then they'll, they think like, Oh, then my family's going to love me. It's, yeah. I want you know. Now, there's just that really weird thing that our mind does, you know. Yeah. Uh, 
dude's scary, Boy. man. I pray for the everybody bra- right now. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, just the brain, the way in which it works and, and how it... Oh, I thought you were talking about that shower trick you keep doing every Thursday. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> Oh, I don't want to know. Well, I mean. This is why. Uh, <laughs> I mean, ass is involved. Uh, <laughs> uh, All right. Well, do you guys have any last words for our listeners or any words of encouragement or just anything you want to tell them? Don't do drugs. Stay in school. Or if you do drugs, Stop stay in school. Roll. Stop don't drink and drive, drive but don't drink drive. <laughs> drink. Do the watermelon <laughs> drink. Uh, yeah, that's what uh, it's so. If you don't listen drink, to me, don't listen right. to me. Yeah, yeah, one of those. If you do drugs, do the good ones. Don't be a pussy. Yeah, <laughs> weed's okay. <laughs> the earth, it's all right. <laughs> oh my god. Um. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Drive, but I just can't get pulled over. <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. Oh, just uh, yeah. I t- I'll tell you this. They're joking, kind of. Um, not really. What? I said they're joking, kind of. Not really. Oh. No, serious talk. Real, real talk. <laughs> um, you're not weak. You're not. You're not. You're not pussy. You're not. Anything other than just trying to seek help. Seeking help is like gathering knowledge, and knowledge is power. And bros and brolets, I we for saying, "Hey, I tap out. I can't do this on my own. I need some fucking help." Yeah, that's all it is. I just need some help. Not saying that. Someone else is going to take that burden from you. You're still going to have to put in the work. You're going to have to do it your damn self. But you you can't do it completely on your own. You know, seek help. It, it's it's easy to do. It's not easy to accomplish. Like there's numbers out there. Pick up pick up phone, pound them in. But actually being able to do those actions is very strong. So you're not weak by doing that. And I wish a lot of people in my life had the strength to, to cowboy up and do that. And for me, the, the advice that I can kind of like the last straw advice that I give to people is even in the darkest moments, the worst pain emotionally that I've felt in my life, at least I was alive to experience the pain. Mm. If you experience the pain, you're still alive and you're still in it. As soon as you check out and you no longer feel the pain, can't come back. This is a one-time shot. Um, So I take comfort and it's counter to a lot of what people feel, but I take comfort in feeling the pain and experiencing it, whether it's emotional, physical, because at least I'm alive to experience it because I have friends, whether it's suicide accidents. Uh, I have a good friend of mine who was a cop in San Marcos, Texas. He was a reservist Toasty, who I interact with um, at Deepwater Horizon served a warrant on his day off and is no longer with us. And every day I remember, I think at least I'm alive to feel the pain because Ken can't anymore. He didn't have the choice. Dude, that's pretty sick. So that's that's just what yeah. I do. I go at least I'm alive to feel the pain. I I totally get behind that. <clears throat> Holy crap! I'd say that's giving Mother Nature. I I am not Suck crying. <laughs> <laughs> really? Oh, I'm not crying for those that are still with us listening to these knuckleheads. I am not crying. <laughs> You'll know what I'm crying, and I will be more than happy to show you what that looks like i uh no i was writing down ken's name because uh i'm in texas and i was like ken san marcus like what are you talking about so i wonder if we have mutual friends yes kenneth copeland 
uh, passed away in 2017, in November of 2017. Kenneth Copeland. Um, Kenneth Copeland. He was oh, a reserve. I story. know he was that a, name. So I met him. He was a PS1 because they were still in existence. Um, was on the day off trying to get <clears throat> uh, Yeah, I think it was November, I guess. I think it was November, December of 2017. Uh, was assisting with a domestic abuse warrant in San Marcos. And he was the first San Marcos police officer killed in the line of duty. And unfortunately, two years later, they had their second. Um, shortly after that, a younger officer. Ken was a man of I think he had five kids and a wife. Like, Jesus. yeah, you know, hey. Just, Dude couldn't pull out of a he fucking was, driveway. Yeah, he was a man of God. He believed it. Uh, I, I only knew Ken for two months. But it was very apparent that his family was number one. And, and he would get off his back for anybody. I know that so, name. I know. I don't. I I just saw his picture. I don't recognize him, but I know that name, and I don't know I why or where I know it from. Ask him. I, I yeah. didn't know any of that. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, my family's all like law enforcement. My brother in law is a state trooper out here in Texas. Former Navy veteran, stepdad's retired chief of police. Like, it's just God dang, dude. I'm gonna have to. Yeah, I'm gonna have to do some digging on him. I th- I know that name from yeah. somewhere. I know the guy that uh, that he was going to arrest was going to trial, but I have not been able to find out any results of that trial. And I've contemplated contacting the uh, the department down there and you know using my credentials and saying, "Hey, I'm a law enforcement officer too." "Quote unquote," can I get the case file? But, You're fucking be. It should be. Yeah, it should I, be a public record, though. If anything's come but, of it, it should be public record. Yeah. Uh, it should. Um, I just find, although I do um, another podcast I've been a part of for a, I come into it every once in a while. Um, that guy's brother who runs that whole podcast is a EMT down there. So I kind of have a way of maybe leveraging that. Well, keep me posted on that. I'm curious. I'm very curious. But with that, I think we're going to sign off with our listeners. You guys hang out with me. And, uh, yeah, so thank y'all for being on and staying up late because I know it's getting late up there. Ish. Yeah. yeah. Is Very it, late. Yeah. yeah. Was it like 10? <laughs> yeah. I got church tomorrow morning. So yeah, better. Uh, better go to- you better go get some sleep. <laughs> oh, my God. Call the prayer like an hour. So, yeah. <laughs> another couple. Oh my god all right well let me sign off so thank you guys again for being here it was a blast yeah it was a pleasure of course well there you have it guys shenanigans with drew tj and pam this was just a one-off show that we just wanted to get out there because a lot of our content is hard so we like to have some fun episodes but we also want to have some insightful episodes and i would i would imagine this was pretty damn insightful so um stick around we got some really cool guests still coming up i'm working on some bigger guests Stay tuned for that. And make sure you subscribe, hit the notification bell, all that crazy, fun, like, logistical crap that you're supposed to do to help me get some numbers. So, all right, guys. I'll see you later, and peace out.